Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Data First Forum, Blazing the Trail of Ronus for Salesforce. So first, we'll talk about the state of SaaS security and just how complicated and easily misconfigured your favorite SaaS apps can be. We'll show you the complex nature of Salesforce, and then we'll demo new Veronis features like classification for files and attachments and new permissions visibility that'll help you secure your SaaS applications with ease. We'll mix in some trivia and prizes, and we'll end things with live Q&A. So let's talk about our presenters. Today, we have Rob Sobers. Rob is our Chief Marketing Officer. David Gibson, who is the Senior VP of Strategic Programs and Band Member of the Advanced Persistent Threats. And Ryan O'Boyle, who is Senior Manager of Cloud Architecture and Operations. And over to you, Rob. I want to start off with asking a quick question. Anybody know what the number 17 million represents? If you've been a Verona's customer, I'm sure you've heard us talk about this number on countless occasions, and it represents the number of files on average that a new employee has access to when they start on day one, right? And we know from our analysis that anywhere between 80 and 90% of those files aren't even going to be relevant for them. So we arrived at this stat from actually performing real-world risk assessments on corporate networks, right? Scanning their data, classifying it, and figuring out what's open and, and what's excessive access. And so the conclusion we arrived at is that there is a ton of risk on premises, right? Data is overexposed and people have access to things they don't need. And this is with IT acting as a gatekeeper. If you remember the good old days of Windows file shares, if you needed access to something, you would maybe open a support ticket or you'd have to call the help desk and then maybe wait a day or two and you'd be added to an active directory group and you'd get the data that you needed. And it was really hard to be able to expose that data to the internet. It's not like you could just right click on a file and you know share to web or something like that. And just because you got access didn't mean you could grant other people access. It's the job of IT to grant access to data. In the SaaS world, there is no gatekeeper, right? Me as an end user, I can log into Okta right now and grant access to any number of Veronis employees to log into different SaaS applications. I have this big admin dashboard and I can you know, add users as I, as I wish. Once they're inside those apps, then sort of all bets are off, right? Think about Microsoft Teams. If I add David or Avia or Ashley to a Microsoft Teams instance, they can then go and create their own teams and their channels, and then they can share. In SharePoint Online, I can simply right-click on a file or open up a Word doc, and there's always that little button in the top right that lets me share with either everyone in the company or with people on the internet, right? So we're not talking about just one or two apps either. We're not talking about Slack and Teams. Pretty much every app that stores critical data has its own built-in sharing features, GitHub, Jira, et cetera. In fact, the average number of SaaS apps that a large enterprise deploys is 187. And this comes from Okta's business at work study. So it's based on actual real data that they see through their application. And each of these applications has their own permission scheme, configurations, sharing models. It's really, really complex. Now, to make things even more challenging, you've got many of these apps linked together, right? Through API integrations, maybe there's some built-in configurations, customizations. And each of these connections represents another attack path for threat actors. Right? We've seen lateral movement. Many of our threat labs that we do, our attack simulations, show you how a user can hop from Slack into Salesforce, into GitHub, and kind of go back and forth between these different apps. This complexity breeds risk. And SaaS apps tend to have a lot of configuration. And David will go into that uh, in depth today with Salesforce. When it comes to vulnerabilities and bugs in SaaS applications, here's a real world example for you. So our Threat Labs team, who does a lot of SaaS and cloud research, discovered a bug in Salesforce. And it was a weird interconnectivity issue between Salesforce communities and something called Einstein Activity Capture, which lets you sync your Gmail or Outlook calendar to Salesforce. The end result was that Salesforce didn't realize that these two things were playing together in a very weird way. And your Salesforce admin's personal calendar was being exposed to the internet. Right. And that calendar included things like attendees, the body of an email or the body of a uh, calendar invite. Think about all the sensitive data that you might put in the, the body of what you think is a private meeting request. 
Luckily, Salesforce's amazing security team responded quickly when we reported the issue and they fixed it. However, if you have a Salesforce community and it was created prior to last summer, you might still want to check your configurations. And if you have any questions, we're happy to help you with that. Taking complexity one step further, it's important to think of Salesforce and many of these SaaS applications you know, as these customizable creatures. I think with all the configuration options and custom apps and the app exchange, there's really no two Salesforce instances that look exactly the same. A friend of mine works at a bank and they do all of their mortgage applications through this front end web application. Think about all the things you have to supply when you wanna get a mortgage or a home loan. You have to give your W-2, your tax statements, you know, bank balances, all this stuff that you're uploading as attachments. And my friend's application spits all that data into Salesforce and it gets attached to objects within Salesforce. And so, um, you know, you might have some built-in encryption and, and some uh, features within Salesforce to make sure that data is secure at rest. But a lot of teams don't know where that data lives or who can access it. Um, also, when it comes to SaaS applications, there's this concept of a you know, shared responsibility model. Salesforce and Google and these, these big SaaS providers, it's their job to secure the infrastructure, the data center, right? And make sure nobody compromises the infrastructure itself. But the data you put inside, it's up to you to make sure only the right pe people have access, that you're monitoring that usage, and that if something abnormal is happening, you can respond to it. So here's some real world things we see when we analyze Salesforce, when we do a risk assessment on people's Salesforce instances. So we were working with a national bank and we found actually 10 shadow instances that the CISO team had no idea existed, right? The Salesforce team knew they were there, but they were basically copies of production data and represented a lot of risk that the security team should have known about. We had 23 regular users that had a really obscure permission set that was giving them access to do things that really only admins should. And we also detected some suspicious login activity against Salesforce coming from Tor browsers. When we did a similar risk assessment for a real estate firm, we found almost their entire Salesforce, 182 regular users had the ability to export literally every single record, meaning all their customer lists, quotes, opportunities, everything. And they were working with 12 contractors in Romania and India that they terminated their agreement with, but they still had access. They could log in. And in fact, some of them were still logging in. And so that was new information for them. And they had to decommission those accounts and figure out what they could have done in the interleaving period where they had this, this access that they shouldn't have had. And then, you know, this, the familiar story of a sales rep actually giving the resignation and then downloading everything they had access to before they left to bring it to a competitor. So we really like to think about SaaS risk in three big buckets, right? There's collaboration risk. Users have the ability to share, collaborate, and open access. They never had that before in the on-prem world. You have the API risk of connectivity between these apps and not really quite understanding how they all work together and what new attack paths might be created as a result. And then we have your misconfigurations and vulnerabilities as well. Probably the best example of the need to know what's going on within your SaaS apps is the recent Okta lapses incident. Um, Okta put together this great video between their CEO and their CISO talking about what went on behind the scenes during this time period. It's at okta.com slash transparency. I really recommend watching it. But one thing that David Bradbury really underscores is how important it was for them to be able to circle all the things that this support engineer that was compromised could have accessed so that they could quickly communicate to their partners, their shareholders, their customers, that this was a limited incident and that this person didn't have access to data X or data Y. They only had access to data Z. And so it may seem at first glance as, oh, this is a nice to know type of thing. But in the midst of an in incident, you really need to be able to understand your blast radius and answer the question, what did this person have access to and what did they actually touch? Okay. So, you know, I think the, uh, as Rocky would say, What's the blast radius? Um, he did that really well. And uh, of, of a user, right? If Melissa Donovan uh, went to our competitor uh, and she's the competitor is now showing up every account, this is every company's worst nightmare. Um, it's hard enough to lose a good rep to a competitor, but giving them any kind of marketing head start is just an insult to injury. So 
what would we have to do to discover the blast radius of Melissa Donovan? So we took a, a dive into Salesforce to try to figure out what she could have done and what did she do in Salesforce. So the first place we have to look is something called a profile. So the Salesforce profile has been kind of the bedrock, the way permissions have started for a long time. And we can see she's got the account executive profile. So what does that really mean? If we dive into her profile, we can see lots of settings. And each one of these settings has more settings inside. Two of the most important ones when it comes to figuring out her blast radius, though, are the uh, the, the system permissions. This really describes what actions she can take in Salesforce and also the object settings, what objects she can access in Salesforce or actually what kinds of objects. And I'll dive into more in that in a second. So let's dive into system permissions first. So in system permissions, we can see quite a few settings listed here and they're helpfully placed in alphabetical order in a long flat list. Uh, we can see all sorts of functions here, like managing applications, managing multi-factor authentication, exporting reports, scheduling reports, subscribing to reports, transferring records, viewing all data, and even managing sharing roles and users. Um, so I'm going to write those down. What, uh, what about the object settings? Well, when we look at the object settings, we can see all the different kinds of objects she can access, like which contacts, leads, or opportunities, and what she can do, like read, edit, create, or delete. Now, each of these objects is made up of fields, uh, so you're going to have to dive, or we have to dive into the to each of these objects and get down to the field level to see which fields they can access. And I guess we'll have to write these down. Um, it gets better. In 2012, Salesforce introduced this concept of permission sets. And these are like mini profiles. So they have a lot of the same settings or most of the same settings, and you can set those individually. And then these permission sets are additive to the profile. And even better, in 2020, Salesforce added permission set groups. And these make it easier to add multiple permission sets to a user. Uh, so we'll need to write these down. Uh, and this is just to see what kinds of objects she has access to and what she can do with them. It doesn't tell us about which objects she can access. To do that, we need to check a few things. So the first place is we need to look at something called the organization-wide defaults. And here we can see the rights that people have, like for example, some objects may be only accessible by the owner and some of them are accessible by everybody in addition to the owner. But most of them are going to be granted access via hierarchy so that people above people in the hierarchy will be able to see all their reports objects, right? So if I'm a, a, a leader of sales, I can see all the records that are created and accessed by the people below me. So first we'll need to figure out where she is in the hierarchy and then she'll have access to her stuff and all the people that report to her. And we'll also need to check something called sharing rules. You can dynamically set up what objects get shared with whom uh, based on different characteristics like locations or products or things like that. And there's more. So you've also got to check that individual objects aren't shared with her. You also need to consider field level security, which can ratchet down access to different fields. And then also take into consideration something called muting permissions, which is part of the permission sets. So you get the idea, figuring out the blast radius, what she could have done in Salesforce is not going to be a quick thing. And we're going to be writing a lot of things down. Do we know what she did take? Well, only if we've got uh, a, a solution like Data Advantage Cloud or we bought Shield and integrated that into monitor, our monitoring environment. Without Shield, uh, there's no record of what data is being accessed. What about tracking changes to all these configuration settings? Well, if you go into the setup audit trail, you can see the last 20 configuration changes in Salesforce. Um, but in order to get a longer record, you're going to need to regularly download that set of setup audit trail to a CSV and put that somewhere that's useful. 
What about understanding what she had that was access to that was really sensitive? Well, you know, you can argue that everything in Salesforce is sensitive, but some things are really more sensitive than others. Some of the information might be regulated. Uh, some combinations of information might be regulated. Well, in Salesforce, we can manually map fields to sensitivity labels if we upload a CSV file or map them and or map them to compliance categories. But if we haven't done that step, then we really are kind of uh, treating all data as equal in Salesforce. Now, if we take a look at just the overall picture in terms of data protection, we like to think about in three dimensions, who can access data, who does access data, and what's important. I think we can see here the access controls, who has access, calculating that blast radius is a big project. Uh, you can't really monitor and understand change unless you're downloading that setup audit trail, right, or ingesting that. Uh, monitoring who's actually accessing data is impossible without Shield or another solution. And classification is manual um, without, actually, there's a new uh, module in Shield called Data Detect, which can analyze some fields uh, individually for some basic patterns, but not combinations of fields, nor can it analyze attachments and all, you know, kind of some of that, that really juicy data that can be in there. So that's really the picture of data protection right now, just figuring out that blast radius. Well, thanks, David. You know, that was a really great, very in-depth deep dive into, you know, Salesforce and understanding the, you know, the blast radius of a user, as we like to say here on the Verona side, and, uh, you know, understanding the very, I would say, sophisticated entitlements and permissioning model within the Salesforce world. And we're seeing a lot of that translate to the rest of the SaaS applications and cloud apps that we tie into as well. But you know, at this point, I, I think it makes sense to maybe switch gears a little bit and, and let's focus in on, you know, understanding blast radius, maybe from the perspective of someone like a security analyst or you know, someone just investigating a user's activity when it comes to using a platform like DataVantage Cloud. Um, now, I've brought up our DataVantage Cloud UI here. And you know, if I'm an analyst looking into Melissa's activity and maybe some suspicious events generated by Melissa over the last few days, I'm generally going to first interact with the dashboard view of our UI here. This is where I can see an, an overall look into you know, how active our users within the environment, both privileged and non-privileged identities. I could see things like recent alerts that have been generated based off of events that run through our policy engine. And I also get a nice snapshot of some of the risks that we might find across really all the cloud applications that we're tied into across the environment. But for the sake of our investigation here today, I want to take a little bit of a deeper dive into this particular user, right? Melissa, who we've been talking about. As I transition down in here into our investigation tab, I have a couple of different options on how I can actually start to look at this. I'm going to navigate over into my identities view, and this is where I start to get a nice snapshot of the various users or identities around the cloud applications that I'm monitoring within the environment. I can see where I have users generally logging in from. I can see how I've categorized or group identities across the different cloud apps. And of course, one of the first users that I'm going to run into is Melissa Donovan's Salesforce account. So when I click on Melissa here, this is going to bring me to Melissa's identity page. And this identity page is going to look and feel very similar across each cloud application. Uh, we're going to have a very similar type of functionality across each app. Uh, at a high level, we're going to be tagging accounts by you know, various properties. Uh, one of the things that you're going to notice here quickly is that Melissa is tagged as both an, an admin and a super admin. And as we dive into the permissions a little bit more and the various entitlements that are applied to Melissa's account, just like what we saw with David's example, uh, you're probably going to see why. Right? We have a lot of highly privileged access across these accounts through a combination of either you know, combinations of permission sets, permission sets groups, and also things added on top of their profile. I can also see how active Melissa is over the last seven or 30 days. Where does Melissa typically log in from in the world? What types of entitlements are applied to Melissa's accounts? Again, we have to keep in mind the various levels of entitlements in the Salesforce space, being such a sophisticated permissioning model, you know, we not only have the profile to worry about, but also things like the permission sets, permission set groups, and then of course, the various other dynamic entitlements that are applied on top of that. I get a really nice snapshot down here below of all the recent activity generated by Melissa's account. So let's say this was prompted by an alert or maybe prompted by, you know, an insider risk notification. I can see all of the recent records, all the recent entitlements, the objects that were changed or accessed by Melissa's identity. You know, when it happened, 
which IP address and which device it came from. I can also get a very nice aggregated view around these resources from the second panel here. I can actually see the individual objects in the Salesforce space that Melissa interacted with. And of course I can use this to dive into some details around each of those. But at this point, I'm probably gonna start to think to myself, you know, how do we start to understand the, the scope of Melissa's access or you know, what, we like, what we like to call the blast radius of this particular user. And as David mentioned, there are a couple of different areas that we have to take into account when we're thinking about the Salesforce world. It's not just about the ability to interact with data or objects within the Salesforce environment. Oftentimes we need to start by thinking about things like the various system permissions. Again, through the Salesforce entitlements, we're also giving users the ability to perform actions within the application itself. And in order to understand, you know, what is the holistic or overall, or what we call here the effective, you know, aggregated access the user has, you have to take into account their profile, plus any of the various combinations of permission sets and permission set groups that might be applied. So what I'm gonna do here is load up my profile and the three permission sets that I have on Melissa's account, I can quickly triage the various categories of different types of entitlements or permissioning actions that could be applied across this user. And as David had mentioned, you know, we have over 250 actions that can be performed at the system level just from any combination of these different entitlements. So what we're trying to do here on the Verona side is maybe aggregate some of these or the higher priority ones and bring them up to the surface. Let's say, for example, we've had some events where Melissa may have downloaded data out of the Salesforce environment or maybe exported a report. And I want to understand how did Melissa have the ability to even export a report? Well, I can see here that, of course, Melissa can do that. And I can see that in my effective or the aggregated permissions. And I can now see why Melissa can do that as well. Uh, due to the system administrator profile that's applied to her particular account at this point in time, that's how that action was applied. But not necessarily through the two permission sets and the permission set group that are also applied on top of that. So again, we're giving security teams and analysts a really granular way to start to break down these various permissions, hopefully without having to do all the, the writing down, as David was mentioning a little bit earlier. It's not just about the system level permissions, though, or the application level permissions. I may also want to dive a little bit deeper into the objects or the records or the, you know, the data aspects themselves. And that's when we can navigate over to our fields access tab. Within this area, we're going to start to aggregate all the various objects that are being picked up within the Salesforce environment. Again, we're looking at both the standard and the custom objects. And most organizations that we run into have anywhere from maybe 50 to 150 objects uh, that are being used on a, a daily basis. So one of the first things that you're going to notice here is this CRUDS acronym. Again, this is our really simplified effective access model that we apply across the board. Now, this quickly helps us uh, as a security analyst understand, can a user create, read, update, delete, or share on any given object throughout each environment. And again, we're taking the unique permission models across each cloud application, whether it's Salesforce or Google or Box or AWS, we're applying this simplified and singular effective access model to really simplify the understanding of you know, some of those really basic questions like who has access to what and how are they getting the access. Of course, in the Salesforce world, it's not just about the object level permissions, though. As David mentioned, we also have to worry about fields. You know, all the various fields that are found within each object, they can also have unique permissions that are applied. And again, we're applying this effective access model across the board. So I can see here, Melissa has the ability to create, read, update, and delete cases. But when we talk about things like the account name field on any given particular case, uh, only has the ability to see that. Yeah, they, they have read access here, not necessarily create or modify. We can also quickly understand how this user gets the access, both from the object perspective, as well as the field perspective. And in this particular case, it's due to the profile that's applied to Melissa's account. So we're getting a little bit deeper, right? We're diving into the data side of things a little bit. We're starting to look at you know, the objects and the fields. But now the question might arise of, you know, what actual records can Melissa access? I, I saw quite a few that were touched within the recent resources, but again, I want to understand the blast radius of this particular account. So from here, I can dive into my records access view. And this is essentially allowing us to run something like an entitlement review across this particular user's account. Show me every object and individual record here that Melissa can access. And you know, maybe for example, I see the contacts and have the ability to create, read, update, and delete across contacts. When I start to dive into the contacts themselves, I can 
can see that there are you know, non individual records here that Melissa can interact with. These could be you know, client names, they could be third parties, partners, vendors that the organization is working with. Uh, somebody like Rachel Evans here, a contact within the Salesforce org, Melissa not only can read, update, and delete this particular contact, but we also see a tag here to the right. This is where we're starting to introduce things like the data classification engine across the Salesforce world. We're actively scanning things like files and attachments that are loaded into Salesforce and attached to these various records, things that might contain instances of what we deem sensitive information, whether it's you know, PII or PCI data, HIPAA, regulatory compliances, and even things like customizable roles. So we're actually going out there and scanning the content of these files and attachments that are tied into the various records. And this allows security teams to not only identify who has access to what from a data perspective, but where do we potentially have the highest areas of risk? Right? Where do we have concentrations of things like sensitive data across our Salesforce environment, as well as the various other cloud applications within our ecosystem? So this poses my next question as an analyst of, you know, what else is out there that might be sensitive and how do I start to understand that across my Salesforce environment? But what I'll do from here is actually dive into my compliance tab and I'm switching gears from the identity perspective into more of the resource perspective now. So I'm focusing in on the Salesforce account, uh, the various objects within this particular Salesforce account. I can see that I have a couple instances of sensitive information within the content contact object. Rachel Evans, of course, pops up for this particular record of contacts, and I can see pretty quickly that three files have been uploaded to Rachel's contact, and you know, each contain relevant pieces of sensitive information. I have some PII hits, PCI hits, financial information. Uh, pretty apparent by the file name here that looks like somebody's uploaded Rachel Evans W2 as a PDF onto this particular record, but when I click on this particular file, this allows me to dive a little bit deeper into the details. I can quickly understand who has access to this PDF file, you know, not only Melissa, who we saw before through the system administrator profile, but many other entitlements that are being built out across our Salesforce environment are giving other users some level of access. We could dive into the details there. And even interestingly enough, we could see that an external user, maybe a you know, third party or a developer, Josh Hammond here has the ability to read, update, and delete, just like what we saw with Melissa's account. And then we can also see who's actually interacting with this. And interestingly enough, Josh was the user that uploaded this, who created this file on this particular record. From here, I can dive a little bit deeper into the compliance view. And this actually allows me to understand much better why is this tag to sensitive. So now obviously the name W2 might ring a bell to some folks out there, but if we wanted to understand what actual instances of sensitive information, which strings, which pieces of text, uh, what actually causes to be deemed as sensitive, uh, we can break out all the rules, the regexes, the patterns, the dictionaries, everything that flags here. And of course, we can even do things like full file analysis. I can actually run something like my file analysis engine here. That's going to fetch our file. It's going to do a little bit of text extraction, and it's going to highlight where we have things like you know, potential social security numbers, of course, you know, all fake data in this particular lab environment. So this, again, as a security analyst, allows me to not only understand what is a user done, what do they have access to? Where is our sensitive data located that maybe this user could be interacting with and really start to validate that this actually is sensitive information, that this actually could be something you know, that we might want to investigate and bring back to our HR team. We've talked a lot about the potential access here, though, right? We've, we've done, dove into the identity view a little bit. We looked at Melissa's account individually. Now, the next thing that might come to mind for me, though, is, you know, what else is happening within the environment? What else has Melissa done maybe over a given period of time or maybe across additional cloud applications? And that might be a great transition point for me to jump back into my activity search here and I can run a maybe a broader event sort of query, broader, broader event search at this point. So what I might wanna do is you know, come here to my activity search. I can add a new filter for, you know, actor, action type, IP address, country. In this particular case, you know, I'm still investigating Melissa's activities. So I'm going to search for, you know, all of Melissa Donovan's accounts. And one of the things that we're doing here on the Verona side is actually mapping out the unique identities across the cloud. So, you know, each of these cloud apps is generally a separate vendor. You're going to have unique identities, unique accounts across each one. So when we look at Melissa Donovan's activity across you know, three or four different cloud applications, this is going to give us the same view in a single pane of glass. So I can look at all of the objects that Melissa interacted with, the different types of 
you know, entitlements, records, objects, and not even j- just the Salesforce world and areas like perhaps Google and Box and AWS as well. I can quickly bundle by session ID here to start to bring these into a little bit more of an aggregated view. And as a security analyst performing an investigation here, this simplified view into, you know, not only did Melissa perform some activity within the Salesforce space, but looks like Melissa has been a bit active in the Google world as well. This is a great way to quickly and effectively perform things like cross-cloud investigations. And again, at this point, we're starting to bring things up a level, right? This, this is a little bit more holistic in this sense. And, you know, we started with our deep dive in the Salesforce space and now transitioning a little bit more into this broader cloud ecosystem. Uh, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm starting to also think to myself, where else might I have risks? And with the introduction of things like our reporting views and insights tabs, a data advantage cloud is allowing me to quickly and effectively assess the risk around my cloud posture across not just the Salesforce space or the Google space, but really all the cloud apps that I'm tied into within this environment. We're not only monitoring events on a near real-time basis and you know classifying files and folders and attachments that are being uploaded as they're being created. We're also looking at things like configuration management and posture management, running periodic scans across all of our cloud applications uh, to try to identify things like deviations from best practice, deviations from benchmark, and potentially even risky configurations. You know, do I have an org-wide default here on the Salesforce space that might potentially expose some data to you know, not only internal users, but maybe external users as well. And at this point, you know, I think I have a pretty good handle around what Melissa is doing, what has Melissa done over the past 30 days, what can Melissa do across not just my Salesforce environment, but across my entire cloud ecosystem as well. And I'm starting to bring up some of these risks that we're identifying and, you know, quickly at highlighting across the cloud where we might want to move forward with our posture management. So thanks again, everyone. And we can start Q&A. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, we had a couple of questions come in. Ryan, um, I think one question was like, hey, is this in Veronis? What, where is this? So you want to just give a background of what folks were, uh, were looking at there? Yeah, definitely. So our support for the Salesforce space is, is all really done through our Data Advantage Cloud offering. So this is our, it's really our first SaaS offering that we're providing out there. Uh, it's, it's spun up as its own separate tenant, but ties into not just Salesforce, but also areas like Google and Box and AWS and a whole host of different SaaS applications. Um, so a little bit of a different interface than maybe some of the on-prem world that you might be looking at today. Um, but all done through, you know, your own individual SaaS tenant, you tie in directly to each cloud application via API, um, and it allows you to bring all this together into, you know, a single data advantage cloud UI. Excellent. Uh, and we also got a question in that said, from a Salesforce perspective, do they need to buy anything else uh, from Salesforce like Shield in order to monitor with data advantage cloud? My understanding is no, they don't need any additional Salesforce licensing. Is that correct, Ryan? Yep, you're spot on there. We can work with just a, a basic enterprise licensing and you know, no shield required for things like event collection. You know, we tie in through a proprietary mechanism. Great. Oh, I, I, I love seeing the questions coming in. Uh, keep them coming, folks. Uh, Rob, uh, we had a question about the accuracy of the classification, you know, and the sensitivity there. Um, can you shed some light on that? Yeah. Excuse me. Sure. Um, So the classification technology that we use in Data Advantage Cloud is it stems from the technology we built for on-prem in Microsoft 365. So it's the same core engine. And so we've got, you know, over a decade of battle testing uh, for our rules and our patterns and our methodology. So um, it's an extremely accurate and uh, efficient system. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if you add anything to that, but Yeah, I mean, one thing that we're seeing as a great advantage for a lot of organizations is having kind of a single holistic classification program across not only multiple cloud applications, but also a hybridized environment, too. So the on-prem world, Um, you know, we're using things like proximity keywords, negative proximity, regexes. As as Rob said, there's really a lot that goes into every single rule, and it's very flexible, too. So we can validate it and make adjustments as needed. Yeah, and these rules, these policies, as we call them, may take in, into account many different factors to consider something sensitive. You know, a, a simple reg, reg, regular expression or pattern match may not be as accurate as something that can be validated ag- algorithmically or is a combination of different fields. You know, David, you mentioned that, like sometimes something by itself isn't sensitive, but then you combine it with a few other things and it is. And these policies are being created by 
world's experts in these. So you don't have to create your own. Of course, you know, you can, if you have something specific to your org, but um, our goal with our, all of our classification products is to take the heavy lifting off of, off of the customer and develop these patterns for you. Yeah. And I, I, I guess that's worth kind of mentioning, you know, we started classifying data in, in 2009. Um, and so even though data advantage cloud and, and for Salesforce, it's new, I, I think we've been able to leverage the, the years and the mileage that we've had classifying data and refining those rules and patterns um, over the years. And, you know, I think, you know, I, I forget the last time we, we t- talked about how many customers we have, but it's somewhere north of 7,000. And I think like 70% of them now are, are using our classification engine. So those rules have a ton of mileage there. Yeah, um, and with Salesforce, you know, if you have a field called social security number or patient ID, you can be pretty sure, you know, especially if it's like a, a pick list or something like that data is structured and it's going to store that. With attachments and unstructured data in general, you don't know what you're getting, you know, like a a PDF file, we have to scan it, we have to parse it, we have to OCR certain types of files. And this is really where the complexity lives. And so for us to be able to bring this to the table for Salesforce, I know what the customers that I've spoken to so far is kind of a game changer for them. Yeah. And that those, I, I think also, you know, in terms of files, we've been dealing with some of the largest data sets there too. So, you know, being able to kind of battle test the, uh, the patterns there. Um, and this kind of leads into another question um, is how is this installed? Um, you know, cause a lot of folks are used to the on-prem software that we have, but Ryan, can you go over the, the, just the installation and, and how that works a little bit? Definitely. So again, just to, Taking a quick step back, we, we are tying into the Salesforce organizations uh, through Data Manage Cloud, which is our SaaS offering. So uh, you would have a dedicated tenant for your organization hosted you know, within our, our cloud hosting. Um, we then connect from your Data Manage Cloud SaaS tenant into your Salesforce organization via an API connection. And there's really kind of two API connection points. Um, and we have a, a proprietary event collection mechanism that gets put in at that point onto you know, the layouts within the Salesforce objects. Uh, from there, that allows us to capture things like access events and modify events and all the different types of activity that are happening within the Salesforce org. So we're not necessarily relying on things like Salesforce Shield for an audit trail in that capacity. Uh, we're also pulling out things like set up audit trail and other management or administrative style of events and, of course, authentication and login activity, too. Um, so all of that is done through a series of API connections that get brought back into your dedicated Data Advantage Cloud tenant. Right. So just to clarify, um, this is a SaaS offering, right? It's uh, somebody asked, can we install this on premise right now? That right now it's just a SaaS offering, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, and then we did have a question come in. Um, how long is the data stored in Data Advantage Cloud? You know, we saw like the setup audit trail and Salesforce only has 180 days. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, for all that activity and all those changes we're seeing, how we're approaching storing that? Yeah, for us, it's it's really customizable and, and really quite flexible. Uh, we, we generally start most organizations with 180 days, but we do have the option to carry those longer. Again, we, we don't necessarily have restrictions on how long we, we store those logs for. It's more of a configuration setting that we would work with you on you know, individually. Great. And and how about the uh, the field value changes, right? And what's, what's it like to search and query on that? All right, so... When we're looking at an organization, let's say, and, and I'm going to bring in a couple questions here because I see a few a few different questions on which objects are supported, which fields are supported. Um, so I'm going to try to cover all these together. Um, you know, first and foremost, we, we do support both standard and custom objects. So you know, the standard out of the box ones that are provided with your org, as well as any custom ones that you build out there, we have the the ability to support all of them, and that can be you know, deployed through an automated deployment mechanism. Um, we also support all of the field level visibility within both standard and custom objects. 
Um, when we're looking at the audit trail, it's, it's primarily going to be based on the record level for things like the, you know, the access and the modification events, uh, generally not so much down to the field level without you know, adding context from, from the shield side. So uh, that's where we're really focusing more on the records themselves. And then when it comes to the permissions visibility and understanding who can access what and how they're getting the access, uh, you know, that's supported across, again, all objects and all fields, and then also applied down to the individual records when you're running something like an entitlement review on a user. Great. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in, um, you know, for the insights, can we push changes uh, or just report? I think it's a great question, you know, and you can kind of see in our history, we, we, uh, we've kind of started with the visibility and being able to show you the, uh, the, the kind of risks that people ought to remediate. And we've over time automated many and many of those uh, those those risks. So um, can't really talk about roadmap on this call, but you know for right now we are showing you the risks uh, and you can kind of use our history to gauge you know the the things that we we usually do. Um, and then I think another uh, question here that we can cover with this is the integration with the on-prem installations. Um, so you know I, I think one of the steps that that kind of it, we've already accomplished here is integrating the classification policy, right? So, and, and you know, Ryan, I don't know whether you want to talk about some of the other integration steps we've already done, um, but you know, again, it's roadmap. We can talk about that more, uh, you know, on a private call and, and the pace of things. But you, you get the idea here. You know, our approach to data security has been to have those three dimensions across the data stores, and we've seen that the more places you put data, the harder it is to protect, and the more uniform more unified view can add value there. Um, so hopefully that answers the question as much as we can. Uh, Ryan, any, or Rob, anything you'd add to that? No, pretty, pretty spot on. And I, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you know, we're just getting a lot of great feedback from organizations that are kind of using a holistic classification approach, you know, call it a classification program, you know, not just across things like files and attachments and Salesforce, but then also across you know, your unstructured data repositories like your ice lawns on-prem. So you have a really nice consistency around, you know, what your organization deems as sensitive information. Excellent. Um, getting a couple in. Um, the, uh, you know, I think I see some very specific questions on exactly how to audit some different fields. I think maybe that deserves a deeper conversation. Right. Uh, if, if this uh, person wants to, to see, you know, exactly what we track and where um, I'm not seeing any other questions that have come in besides that. Any I'm missing that you guys see. No, and it, you know, I, I think just as a, a follow up to this, would would love to have a deep dive into the application and and really dive into the details of you know some of these field level changes and you know, the different things that we're doing within custom objects. So, you know, if anybody would like to to dive into that a little bit deeper, would be glad to to take a follow up and you know let's let's talk about it. Let's let's dive into the labs. Yeah, and you can also just set it up and point it to your Salesforce and kind of see it on your own data. What's cool about this is like it, it doesn't require like an app install within Salesforce, you know, it's just an API based thing. And so that that's something that I would recommend as well. Yeah, it's a great point, Rob. It's you know, generally pretty quick. I like to say about you know, 15 minutes to set up per org. So we see a lot of organizations take advantage of that. And at the end of the day, just doing some basic scanning to see what kind of risk is out there. You know, you at least walk away with you know, a, a nice level of clarity out of it. I see another question that's in the chat is, um, is it a full fledged DLP solution then? And, you know, I know this comes up in, in meetings every now and then about data advantage cloud is like, how does this compare to DLP or maybe like a CASB or SSPM? Yeah, and I, I could take that one, Rob, you know, I think it's important to think about the, the architecture and how Veronis works. You know, we're not necessarily sitting in line like a maybe traditional CASB or, or DLP might be when it comes to, you know, really focused on like retroactively blocking and tackling. Uh, we, we've kind of decided to take a little bit of a different approach to it. And, and really the focus here is, you know, first understanding and prioritizing the risk by doing things like proactive classification and scanning of the data at rest, you know, what, what's already out there, and then tying that into all of the permissions mapping and then allowing you to monitor the activity around that. Um, so 
definitely, I would say, a complement in the DLP and CASB space, but a little bit of a different perspective and a slightly different approach, right? Really focused on the, the proactive scanning and the proactive identification of risk and helping you lock that data down and, and make sure we reduce the blast radius for our users. Yeah, and actually um, a customer that uh, that we're installing, I think, maybe this week, their big use case is Salesforce audits. And, you know, the blast radius is very helpful, as I mentioned, with the Okta situation and knowing under the gun, like what a person had access to who was compromised, but also proactively auditors really want to make sure that you understand and can limit access and kind of get to that least privilege privacy by design model. So that might be another sort of jumping off point or something to think about when, you know, when considering what a CASB can do versus what you've seen here today and the level of granularity that, that auditors expect. Cool. Um, cool. We had uh, just two last ones, and then I think I think we're we're going to run out of time here. Um, one is is the alerting uh, included in Data Advantage Cloud right now that that is included, right, Ryan? Yep, exactly. Yep. Okay, and then one last one is the struggle we have is uh, given a sysadmin to some users because we can't figure out what objects they need access to to accomplish what they're trying to do. Um, how would we help? I feel like that's 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 a great use case for us, right? To kind of show exactly how somebody's getting permissions and what they're using. Do you agree? Absolutely. So not, not only you know what can they access, but what are they accessing right through the audit trail to make sure that you know if we're starting to take access away, we're not. You know, breaking the business or removing somebody's access that they're going to you know, open up an anger ticket with us. Thanks everybody for joining. Thanks everybody. Hope to see you on the next data first forum.